And what a great question. If it's magic, why isn't it everlasting? If love is present, if spirit is the divine reality, if this is the truth, why don't we always know it? Why, don't always, why do we not always experience it? Right? And we see it out in nature. We see it as Lady so beautifully did in our invocation. It's all around us. It's everywhere. It's, it's in the absolute reality, but it's also on the seashores and in the trees and in the stars. And it is everywhere present. And yet, it's not always present for us every moment of every day, is it? It's not always available to us. It comes and it goes. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about that all month. The very reality of the presence of the Spirit as us, as it is seeking to create life. As we are seeking to create life, our life. And the lives of the people that we love and care about, our collective life together. And so this fabulous book, Big Magic, Creative Living Beyond Fear. So, why is it not everlasting? Creative Living Beyond Fear. So today that's where we're going to start, moving beyond fear, having the courage to create big magic. And that starts with the strength of heart that we have, right? the strength of the truth and the understanding that we have of who we are, how life works, how the universe is in our favor, how this whole a trajectory, the whole stream of life is for greater life, for us to express ourselves, be ourselves, share the truth of our being, do that great work in the world that is our inner purpose, and to be all that we can be, to have the courage to do that, right? And, and courage comes from that, that uh, fr French word that means heart, courage, we find in our hearts, in the truth of who we are. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what is fear, what is courage from a physiological point of view, an emotional point of view, and a spiritual point of view, so that we can take a look at what we know about it and how we move beyond it. So the first thing we want to talk about is physiologically, there's a physical experience of fear, right? We have fear, and, and there's reasons for being afraid. Uh, this might be one of them, that might be one of them, right? There are reasons why fear is built into our system. It keeps us safe. And we can identify something in a heartbeat. We can identify just that fast. Is this thing trying to get us, attack us? Is it something that we need to deal with because it's life-threatening? And so we either fight it, flee from it, or we freeze and hope it doesn't notice us. <laughs> but fear keeps us safe. And so this is part of our limbic system. Our internal brain, our limbic system processes this information. It was, and so, but of course, we're not we're not dealing with sharks and tigers, are we? Sometimes, <laughs> but not really. Usually, out in Dallas, it's a jungle out there, but it's a different kind of jungle, right? So, but we could have many examples where we're walking down the street, we're ready to cross the road, and the bus is coming. The stimulus is the bus is coming. And our amygdala is the interpreter of this stimulus. And its question is, is this life threatening? That's its question. And it interprets the stimulus, is it life threatening? And if it's a bus barreling down at us, you know, 50 miles an hour, and we're about ready to cross the road, our amygdala says, this is life threatening. And we jump back on the curb, and we're safe. Our heart might be pounding, right? Our palms sweating, we might be, you know, our bodies might be racing like, oh, that was close. But we're safe. Fear has its place. It has its purpose. And its job is to keep us safe. The problem, however, it comes when we look at things and we assess them as life-threatening. And perhaps that's not necessarily true. 
For it might be true that this situation is, in fact, life-threatening. So when I was, um, I don't know, let's see how old I was, hmm, 15 or 16, 16, I guess, I was living with my foster family, and um, all the adult children were there, the partners of adult children, they were with my uh, foster mom, and there were, I don't know, seven, eight of us in the room. Um, everybody knew everybody, been in and out of the house lots and lots and lots of times. A pretty close-knit group of people. And one of the daughters, grown daughter, and her um, boyfriend, they had a beautiful German Shepherd, two, two and a half years old. Um, really large, beautiful animal. He'd been in and out of the house. He'd grown up um, in and out of the house. And everybody, you know, we were sitting around talking after dinner, having a lovely evening. And um, we still don't, I, I still don't know what happened from one second to the next. With, with apparent, no apparent provocation, um, the German Shepherd attacked my foster mother um, in the room, went for her throat, mauled her chest, mauled her hand. Um, it was truly, truly one of the most frightening experiences I've ever had. It took some time to recover from that. And you bet, I had that whole fear response. And, um, and that was not, that was not good. And so, yeah, there are things that happen to us. There, there are definitely things that happen to us that, that we learn to be afraid of. We learn to keep ourselves safe. But again, the challenge is whether or not what's going on is actually life-threatening. And so when we think about fear from an emotional point of view, I don't know about you, but I grew up with a monster under my bed. I, I did. Oh, my God. And I was pretty sure there was one in my closet, too. The closet door had to be closed, and I was one of the... I, my, my toes and my fingers, they couldn't, they couldn't hang over the edge of the bed. I hated that. I hated that when they hung over the edge of the bed. It was terrible. And yes, actually, I was the child who said, Mom, you have to, is, is, there, is my bed okay? Would you check underneath for me? Even though, right, of course, there wasn't actually anything there. And how many of us, I love this example, right, we, we, we've decided, uh, somebody has decided they want to be in relationship to us, be in relationship with us, and what do we do? We go running the other way because we're afraid. We've been hurt before, it hasn't worked before, it's a you know, terrible idea, whatever it is, uh, and, and we go running because we've decided it's life-threatening, <laughs> or it's threatening to us in some way. You see, at the emotional level, we have then the, hmm, the tendency to experience that rush of fear, and because we, have, it, we know that it's keeping us safe, and we've had experiences that have taught us that there are things to be afraid of, that when that emotion rushes up, through our system, we behave as if the thing we're afraid of is in fact life-threatening. So this is called the low road from our um, sensory input into our amygdala. And, and it goes right into our amygdala and our amygdala says, yes, this is life-threatening, you better run or fight or become paralyzed. But what we know, of course, is 90% of the time, it's not actually life-threatening. We aren't actually going to die from it. And we have the opportunity of interrupting that process. So that's that high road when, the, when our cerebral cortex actually gets involved. And what is our cerebral cortex but our ability to think? Is this true? Is it true? that this is life-threatening? Is it really true that this is life-threatening? Am I gonna die by trying to get into this relationship and seeing whether or not it will work? Will I die, will I actually die if I do public speaking? Will I really <laughs> die of embarrassment if it doesn't work out? Really? Do you see our cerebral cortex, our ability to think allows us to ask the question, is this an, a real fear? Is this something really to be afraid of, physiologically? 
or perhaps there's another way that we can engage with it. There's another thought we can have about it. There's another idea. Martin Luther King says, courage is the power of the mind to overcome fear, to see it for what it is and to overcome it. So when I was um, first in Seattle, I, um, was, I left the university very early and I decided to go to work and uh, I went into real estate. It was great. I had a great time. I made lots of money. I decided that I was going to really just do the deal. Um, and I had a, a lovely a woman who was my boss. She mentored me. She, she was really, it was really great. And so I did well. I did well in real estate. And so one of the things that you do in real estate, for those of you who don't know, this is, this is long before the internet or social media. Um, you go out and you have a farm, and so you draw a little picture on a map, and you say, okay, this little area, I'm going to learn about this little area, I'm going to be like the real estate person for this little area, and you go out and you knock on doors, and you give them your brochure and your, and your um, business card, and you say, hey, I'm an expert in your area, if you want to buy or sell, call me. If you don't have a real estate agent, call me. And so that's what you do, you farm your little area. So I went out and I would go out on Saturday morning and I would drive out and have my little pile of brochures and, and um, business cards next to me. I would drive out, I'd park in the, in the road, you know, entering into my little farm area that I had picked out. I would drive there and I would sit in my car and I would cry for two hours. Then I would carefully throw all my brochures and everything in the trash can and I would go back, yeah, did my farm. I'm good at this. You bet. I'm going. I'm going to town. Okay, well, yeah, well, I really couldn't face my boss after two or three or four or five months of that anymore, just lying through my teeth about it. And finally, I said to her, I said, look, I said, here's what's, here's what's happening. I haven't knocked on a single door. I go there, I just sit there, and I cry for two hours, and then I throw all my stuff away, and I come home because... The truth is I'm terrified there's going to be a big dog. I'm terrified. I can't get out of the car. I'm afraid there's going to be a big dog. And I'm afraid it's going to attack me. And I can't get myself out of the car. And she said something to me that I have never forgotten. I have used it my whole life when I have found myself in that position where my heart's pounding, my palms are sweating, I'm terrified that something horribly wrong is going to happen. And she said to me, she said, well, you know, when you're sitting in your car, you put your fear right there in the passenger seat. And you talk to your fear, and you say, really, in all of these houses, how many dogs do you think there actually are? Let's, let's say there's a lot. Like 10 out of the 100 homes you're supposed to knock on the door. That's okay. I give you permission not to go to those 10 homes. So if you hear a dog, or there's a chain link fence, and you're not sure that a dog isn't going to come barreling around from the, back, from the backyard, don't go. That's okay. You don't have to go to those places where you hear a dog. But otherwise, she said to me, you take your fear, you put your arm around your fear, and you say, honey, that's okay. You and me, we're going in together. And that's what I practiced. That's what I practiced. Putting my arm around my fear and saying, it's okay. It's okay for you to be afraid. But you and me, we're going in anyway. It's all right that we're afraid. We're going to do it anyway. And what did I discover? There were three houses with dogs. <laughs> there were 96 houses that I could go to and knock on the door and do my job. I had, like, I had written off all 100 because of my fear. Do you see? But when I was willing to face the fear and do it anyway, look at it, and understand what was going on and not allow the fear to run me, you see, now we're standing in the truth of our being. We're standing in who we really are. And I had to find that place where I was not my fear. I was not my story. I was not my situation. I was not any of those things. But I was the one who could decide 
what to think about, how to see it, how to engage with it. Elizabeth Gilbert, she talks about fear this way. First of all, she says, over the years I've been wondering what family, what finally made me stop playing the role of pit pitiful pearl almost overnight. Surely there were many factors involved in that evolution, the tough mom factor, the growing up factor, but mostly I think it was just this. I finally realized that my fear was boring. <laughs> My fear was a song with only one note, one, only one word actually, and that word was stop. My fear never had anything more interesting or subtle to offer than the one emphatic word repeated at full volume on an endless loop. Stop, 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 stop. Be safe, don't do it, don't go, to, don't open that door. No, you don't know what's behind it. For the entirety of my young and skittish life, I had fixated upon my fear as if it were the most interesting thing about me, when actually it was the most mundane. In fact, my fear was probably the only 100% mundane thing about me. I had creativity within me that was original. I had a personality within me that was original. I had dreams and perspectives and aspirations within me that were original. But my fear was not original in the least. My fear wasn't some kind of a rare object. It was just a mass-produced item available on the shelves of any generic box store. Yeah. Boring. Not only boring, but it makes our life boring. What does it do? It limits us. It holds us in. It holds us, don't go there, don't do that. Don't know what's going to happen. No, it's, you know, we might fail. It might not work out. No, it's too scary. I don't know, I don't know how it's going to work out. Mm -mm -mm. He says this. She, sorry, she, Elizabeth. Trust me, your fear will always show up. My fear never stopped going with me when I was farming in Real Estate. Never she, she never stopped coming with me. Your fear will always show up, especially when you're trying to be inventive or innovative. Your fear will always be triggered by your creativity, because creativity asks you to enter into realms of uncertain outcome. And fear hates uncertain outcome. Why? It's trying to keep us safe. Remember that? That's its job. Your fear, programmed by evolution to be hypervigilant and insanely overprotective, will always assume that any uncertain outcome is destined to end in a bloody, horrible death. <laughs> Think tiger, shark. Because that's what it's programmed to do, keep us safe. But in keeping us safe, what does it do? It keeps us limited. Don't go there, don't do that. You don't know how it's going to turn out. Oh, oh, no, no, this is safe. This is known. This is comfortable. This is, I can handle this. I can manage this. You see? So when we come from, when we look at our fear from a, physio, from a physical, physiological, and from an emotional perspective, we can see that if we are not paying attention, it runs us. But when we have the courage to live from our spiritual truth, from the truth of who we are, you see, we recognize that we are unlimited beings. It's not possible for God to be limited. It's not possible for God to not be able to do what it needs to do as us. Spirit is always moving through us, seeking a greater expression in us, as us, and through us. That is who we are. So courage, um, Ambrose Redmond says, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the judgment that something else is more important than the fear. It's not that we say the fear is going to go away, but that something else is more important. It's more important to express ourselves. It's more important to give our gift. It's more important to shine our light. It's more important to do whatever it is we've decided that we value or think is meaningful to us than our fear. That 
courage is moving on that which is more important to us. And the most important thing to us in our spiritual growth and evolution is to become at all of who we are. To have the courage to move out of our human need for safety and security and into our spiritual desire to create a life and a world that is beautiful and meaningful, that it works, that is joy-filled. E.E. E. Cummings says it takes courage to grow up and become who you really are. All of our fears, they keep us limited, small, safe. We never have to see how far can we go, how much can we push it, how big can we be, how much good can we do in the world, how well can our business succeed, how great could the book be that we've been to write? How, how amazing would it be to, to, to live the life of our dream? We, we never actually have to do that. So we can complain about it. We can talk about all the things that keep us from it. We can point our fingers out there. Because our fear is keeping us safe. Our fear limits our ability to express the truth of who we are. So from a spiritual point of view, what is fear? What is that? Oh, I want to, I want to do want to quote this. I love this from Elizabeth Gilbert. Be brave. Without bravery, you will never know the world as richly as it longs to be known. Without bravery, your life will remain small, far smaller than you probably wanted your life to be. Yeah. Well, you may be safe. What's that, what is that quote? Um, Ships are safe in harbor, but that's not what ships are for. Yeah, I love that. Ships are actually for the open ocean. So, Ernest Holmes says this. This is my favorite definition of fear. Fear is a positive acceptance that you shall experience that which you dislike. Faith is a positive acceptance that you shall experience that which you do like. So my fear was faith that when I walked down that street and knocked on those doors, not only would there in fact be a big dog, it would be so ill-trained that it would attack me and bite me. I had faith that that was going to happen. You see, Ernest Holmes says, we have all the faith we will ever need. The question is, do we have faith that the worst possible thing is going to happen? Or do we have faith that actually something good will happen? That somehow life is moving in our favor and in some way good will come of these things that we have to have the courage to overcome. Fear is simply misplaced or the negative use of faith, he says. He says, fear arises from that mental attitude which limits the possibility and the willingness of spirit, the possibility and the willingness of spirit to be you. There's nothing wrong with a desire for self-expression. God is more completely expressed through the one who lives largely than through the one who lives meagerly, small. You see, when I didn't get out of the car, I was living the smallest possible life at that moment because I wasn't getting out of the car. I couldn't even move out of that. So how could I do my work? Spirit is here to express as us. We are here to create a life that is meaningful, that is our contribution to the world, that is our expression of our joy and our wholeness and, and who we are in all of our little zany craziness and in exactly and originally as we are. And one of our most extraordinary fears, what? Somebody won't like us. They'll judge us. They won't be happy with us. Well, let me tell you one thing I learned in this process is that they're going to think about you for about five minutes. <laughs> they might talk about you for 10, but you have to live with yourself 24-7. 99.5% of your life, they are not giving you another thought. They're off thinking about somebody else, talking about somebody else. 
I mean, it's our lives that we have to live. We have to, the, and to have the courage to grow into that is to know the truth of who we are. This is a beautiful quote that my mother gave me um, when I was, gosh, I, I think I was 12 or 13. I still have it in her handwriting. Winston Churchill, success is never final. Failure is never fatal. It's courage that counts in the end. The courage to do, the courage to try, the courage to go for it, the courage to not allow our fears to hold us back. Now, I had the pleasure, um, last week I worked with the Dallas Meditation Center, their young adult group, and we had oh, just a lovely exchange, an extraordinary conversation, and, and as we were talking about it, one of the young men was talking about wanting to go for his life and what he was working on and, and what was really drawing him, and, 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 he, and he said, ah, oh, I said, but I'm so, I'm, I'm so afraid what if it doesn't work out and I'm disappointed? Man, there's a thing we fear that, that limits us, our disappointment. We're going to be disappointed that it doesn't work out. Standing with our courage, putting our arm around our fear and doing it anyway does not guarantee that it will work out. But, it, but I guarantee you that nothing will happen if you don't move forward. That is the guarantee. And so we talked about it. And I said to him, what well, part of spiritual maturity and growing ourselves up is learning to move through disappointment, to discover how resilient we are, how powerful we are, how true it is that we can move through anything when we know who we are, when we know that spirit supports us, and we can move through it and say, well, if not this, then that. You've watched us do this with our building. If not this plan, then that plan. If not that space, then this space. And each time, because we didn't allow ourselves to get frustrated and sucked into it, each time it's actually turned out better. Even though in the moment there was disappointment. Do you see? So, what are you afraid of? What fear do you hold on to? Or what fear do you believe in that's holding you back? You received a piece of flash paper when you came in this morning. Um, and if you didn't, I'd love to invite you to, well, I'd like to invite you to get it out and get a pen out. If you didn't, the greeters are coming forward. You can raise your hand and say, hey, I didn't get a piece of flash paper. And ask yourself, what is the fear that I'm willing to let go of, to move through, to say no more will you limit me, no more will you hold me back. Because this fear is not the truth about who we are. So I'm going to invite you to think about that and write just one word down, one word, disappointment or fear, Heard or whatever it is, judgment, whatever, it doesn't matter. One word on that piece of paper that you, the fear that you are ready to let go of, write that word down. Because if we're going to make big magic in our lives, we have to move through these fears. We have to say, you and me, we're going in together. I'm no longer going to let you hold me back. This is no longer going to limit me in any way. I'm doing it anyway. And so we're going to release this fear. Proof it away <laughs> into the divine because it has no spiritual validity, this fear. This fear has no spiritual validity. There's nothing in the divine reality of who you are holding this fear in place. So the question is, do we have the courage? Are we brave enough to let our light shine? Are we brave enough to create the life of our dreams, to create a world that works for everyone, to create the kind of experience that we want to have? Do we have the courage, the strength of heart, to know the truth about ourselves and to say, I am doing it anyway? All right. So as you have written it down, then the, um, we're going to invite you to just pass it into the um, aisles. 
pass it into the aisles and the um, ushers are going to come forward with baskets. So just pass it all the way out to the aisle and the ushers are going to come forward with baskets and we're going to dump it all into the baskets and we're going to bring it all up here. We're going we're gonna to let go of this. What is the quickest, most effective way to get to release our fear? That's right. Burn it in the light of truth, in the sunshine of the divine reality. All right. So we're going to bring it forward. We're going to release it now. I feel the energy bubbling, bubbling in the room. It's very good. <laughs> Because this, we'll, we will see how insubstantial our fears are in just one second. We're going to see how very insubstantial our fears are. How they are a product of our own thinking. I'm probably thinking nobody put shark or tiger in there. Because <laughs> if you see one, run away. <laughs> Yeah, put it right in here. Right? This is not stupidity. <laughs> this is saying I'm no longer run by my limitation, limiting fears. Thank you, you guys. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. And you know, it takes courage. It takes courage to release the protection of these fears. So you have already been courageous this morning. You already have strength of heart because you've said, I'm willing to live a bigger life, a life that has magic and creativity in it, and I'm no longer willing to let this limit me. So, are you ready to release your fear? Yeah.